You're listening to the Mile Marker Podcast, where we explore trends and innovations in fleet automation and shared mobility, helping fleet-based businesses make better informed decisions and achieve full digital transformation. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Mile Marker Podcast. My name is Angela Samoz, and today's guest is Alexander Votes, General Manager of Velocity EV, a Velocity vehicle group company that sells commercial electric vehicles. Alexander was also the Director of Government Programs at Velocity Truck Centers, where he oversaw the introduction of electric vehicles into the market and helped guide the customer's decision-making on what technology is right for their operation. He has spent his career in areas where automotive and technology industries meet, launching several connected car projects, oversaw the autonomous driving team for an OEM, and served as software development manager for in-vehicle entertainment applications. Welcome, Alexander. Hi, Angela. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. No, it's such a pleasure. And with your background, I mean, gosh, our our conversation can go in a number of different ways. But um, let's start by having you give our listeners an idea of what you're working on these days and really, you know, what's your focus and mission as it pertains to electric trucks. Great. Yeah, thanks. And again, thanks for having me. It's always uh, great to talk about what my passion is, which is uh, commercial electric vehicles. And I've been in that space for quite some time now. Uh, actually earned my name as Alex Volts sometimes instead of Alex <laughs> I like Volts. that. I like that. Um, and in my current role, I'm the general manager of Velocity EV, and we are the distributor of the Ryzen truck brand, which is a class four or five battery electric truck from uh, the Daimler truck uh, company. Mm-hmm. And so when people think electric trucks, like, I mean, obviously people see trucks all over the place, right? Of all sizes, but primarily in the news when people hear oh we've got electric trucks happening and they're doing you know uh routes up and down the highways they're thinking of semis right so you've got two simple and kodiak and the big ones but people don't think that well yeah all those other smaller trucks are also going to be going electric as well right so talk a little bit about some of the uh, different types of trucks that are being electrified. Uh, you know, if there's like a, a certain type ahead of the pack, you know, these are going first. Um, and some of the issues that the industry is facing with the transition to electrification. Sure. Yeah. And that is a very important delineation. If we look at electrification of transportation uh, overall in the passenger car industry, it has happened for quite some time. Electric cars, mm-hmm. you can buy them for quite some time. Uh, customers are pretty knowledgeable nowadays about how to charge them and how that all works and have charging at home. But for the commercial vehicle industry, that shift hasn't happened until recently. And I think it is actually one of the largest shifts in the commercial industry that I've seen in my lifetime. Maybe somebody is going to argue with me on that, but it's certainly a big, big change. And it is important to look at all the vehicles, not only the large classes, like you said, the class eights or the 18 wheelers that we see on the highway. Mm -hmm. Um, Those are usually the trucks that come to mind for people, right? Because they see them a lot, but uh, it goes all the way down to class seven, six, five, and four, which are ultimately the vehicles that do your deliveries on everyday items. When you go to the grocery stores, when you go to the, um, uh, your delivery for furniture or linens or Mm -hmm. whatever else. So a lot of the vehicles that drive in our cities are actually these smaller class four or five vehicles. And ultimately, when it comes to electrification, of course, you get the most bang for your buck if you electrify the vehicles that are on the road most of the time. Makes sense. Your, Your car and my car as we sit in here is parked in our driveway or parked at work. And that is what passenger car vehicles do most of the time is being parked. So when we want to electrify, we want to take emissions out of the air. Looking at commercial vehicles is really the most efficient way to do it. And uh, the motivation for going electric is clear. It's really two things. One is to reduce emissions and the other one is to comply with regulations. And uh, different companies have a different motivation, be it more on the reducing emissions or more on the complying with regulations. You can think especially companies that are in the public eye that have consumer products. They oftentimes have general sustainability goals and taking emissions out of their transportation is a big factor there. But then uh, the vast majority of companies, of course, is not in the public eye every day. You don't see them every day. 
So for mm -hmm. them, the, the vast majority of the motivation is to comply with the regulations that are in the market. Right now, we see them in California the most, which is why that's the most action happens in California. But those two tend to be the biggest, the biggest, biggest items. But when we talk about motivation, we've got to talk about problems, of course, as well. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of challenges when it comes to electrification. It is a new technology. There are new players. There are new stakeholders in this whole electrification journey. Customers have a lot of questions. The capability of the vehicles are different. The prices are higher. The lead times are longer. So a lot of companies are trying to navigate these waters and see uh, what all the options are that they have. And it's the big trucks and the small trucks to find the right candidates to start with. Right. You know, you mentioned that uh, there are so many more trucks that are on the road more frequently. So it's a, it's a great way to start because, you know, as you said, our, our cars are mostly um, uh, sitting in our driveways. And you think about it, sure. I mean, just with Amazon delivery trucks, right? Yeah. Uh, they're like little bees all, the time, all over the place, the right? <laughs> and so, but then there are so many other types of trucks. I mean, so do um, construction vehicles fall into this category? Or, yeah. yeah. Essen essentially, almost every uh, vehicle that is paid to be on the road all the time. And it's not the same difficulty level and complexity for every vehicle. That's why uh, most of the vehicles that people think of for electrification first are those back-to-base type of operations or what we sometimes call the hub-and-spoke type of applications. Mm -hmm. So when you think about a grocery store delivery, for example, there is probably going to be one warehouse, one distribution center that goes to the same 10 supermarkets every week. And it's the same route uh, week over week over week. And it comes back to the same location and can plug in there uh, every day. Uh, those are nice use cases for electrification because you know the miles, you know how long they sit to be uh, able to charge and so on and so forth. Other uh, use cases like coast-to-coast uh, uh, -coast moving transportation is probably a lot harder to electrify, right? Because one time you drive from New York to LA, the other day you drive from LA to Michigan or what have you. So that is certainly a lot harder, especially while public charging infrastructure doesn't exist yet for commercial vehicles. So when you think about electrification for commercial vehicles, uh, a big, big uh, question will always be where to charge them. Right, and right. while we see more and more public charging infrastructure for passenger cars, it is certainly very difficult. I've done it before, but it's certainly very difficult to get a big class A truck into a parking spot that was designed for a passenger car. Well, I imagine that you'd have to take up maybe two or three spots, uh, depending on where the port is, because even yes. you know, as, a, as an EV driver myself, the ports aren't always in the right position and you have to back in. And sometimes I'm, you know, parking <laughs> a little to the side or at an angle. Oh, yeah. it, and there's a lot of, you know, design work that needs to be done. But it's a good point that you make about charging infrastructure, right? So even if it's a smaller truck, it's still a truck, right? And it still might not fit. Uh, into the regular charging infrastructure that's out there. Um, so between the desire to electrify, but then also the regulations, a lot of companies are probably thinking, where do I start? Right? Like, what's the first step? Like, I don't even know what to think about first. So what are your tips on, on that aspect? Yeah, and that is an excellent question. And you're right, <laughs> a lot of customers are exactly in that boat. There is so much information on different vehicles, on different technologies, different battery technologies, different charging providers. So the question of where to start is certainly super important. I always recommend a couple of steps to take. I always say, determine what is your driver first. We talked earlier about the motivation, be it the sustainability, be it the um, regulations, whatever the driver is for a specific customer, just be honest about it because that will determine a lot of decisions down the road here. As an example, if you are really concerned about sustainability and um, being environmentally friendly, then maybe not only the charger, but maybe stationary battery storage or photovoltaic solar power, those things might all be important for your overall plan. But if your goal is to meet regulations at the cheapest possible price, then maybe those discussions are not important to you. So being upfront and honest to yourself about why you're doing it is certainly an important first step. Then the second, I would say, know your details, meaning the details of the customer that's actually asking for this. 
know how many vehicles are in your fleet, how long they drive every day, how long they have to charge every day. Do they come back to the same base? Do they all go out at the same time? Because these will all be important considerations when it comes to selecting the charging infrastructure, when it comes mm -hmm. to selecting the right vehicle, and so on and so forth. So uh, having all that information ready certainly is going to speed things up quite a bit. And then I would say create a budget. So uh, understand yeah. what some of these things cost, what some of these vehicles cost, get some quotes from uh, your OEMs, get some quotes from your charger providers, make some estimates about construction, and really get a, a grip on what you think the budget for something like this is. If you look down on the piece of paper, you will see it's a very large number. <laughs> and it's not at 3% more than last year or 5% more than last year it is significantly more money. Um, every new technology costs more money. And in this case, uh, electric commercial vehicles were still in the teenage years. So it is an expensive technology. And because it costs so much money, I would also say assign a champion, assign either a project manager or somebody that has it as their core responsibility to see this through from start to finish. Because you will see that there is so many more players involved mm -hmm. you might want to uh, have an incentive you have your facility manager you might have electricians you might have utility companies so there is a lot of coordination that is needed and then i would say plan plan your vehicle availability when will they come how long do you need for the upfits how does that jive with when you need to uh, meet regulations what is your infrastructure lead time look like which locations to start first and really think it through once you have a champion assigned and they have a little bit of authority, of course, they can drive this a lot better. And then I would also say partner if needed. There is no shame in trying to understand more information or get more information from either your peers, from your suppliers, from your customers. It is a very, very big field and it is a very, very big shift. And there is no shame in trying to get help from outside. Sometimes that help is paid help and sometimes that help is free help. And then the last step, I would say, start and start learning. Because I always recommend, because it is so intimidating, uh, you're much better off starting with something small and then learn in the process and be so much sm smarter when you scale up than to be intimidated away from even starting. I think there's so, some really great specific steps to follow. And um, I almost might put the assign a champion at the at the top right Could because be. yeah. because that person is going to be putting together the budget and the plan and you know the budget can change right so even if you got some quotes at the beginning of the year by the time you're ready to execute prices may have gone up right um mm -hmm. and then you know there's so much research that has to be done you know the type of trucks that you have are they even available in the electric version right and and if they aren't will they be and if they won't then i guess you have to look at a new type of truck right that's uh exactly if, right. If, if that's going to be required by the state right like because if the state says you have to be electric then you, you you can't just say oh well they don't make a truck that i need in the electric version you have to find a different kind of truck so i mean there are so many different pieces and then that's just the hardware part right and the planning we haven't even touched on the the management and the software part right so a lot of these companies are already using fleet management software. Um, they're managing their fleets in, in a few different ways. Perhaps they're still using Excel spreadsheets. I'm not sure. But let's talk about what are some of the new things that they're going to have to start tracking. And then that might cause them to have to change up their fleet management system or systems, right? So what are some of the new things that they'll have to keep in mind that they'll have to monitor um, in this new age of electrification? Yeah, so I think uh, you hit it right on the head. It's certainly information and tracking information and learning from that information becomes more and more important. Uh, today, of course, we do have telematic systems. And when I described earlier about knowing your details, knowing how much your trucks drive and where and how long, that is where most companies will look at is their telematics data, right? Mm -hmm. See what the um, uh, what the daily operation is, how many miles they clock and all that stuff in order to then determine who are the best candidates for electrification. 
And then when it comes to electric trucks and they are actually in the fleet and with all these information, all that information that's being generated and all the education that is necessary, customers will certainly look at their telematics information to see the uptime of the vehicles, to see how the drivers drive the trucks. Are they very heavy footed? Are they going over the speed limit? Are they um, always running it down for 0% state of charge? But then also determining which drivers are very efficient drivers, the kilowatt hours per mile that the uh, trucks have, which is the electric equivalent of the miles per gallon on a combustion engine. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, determined by driver behavior, by the uh, topography, by a lot of different mm -hmm. factors, just like it is on combustion engines. But on combustion engines, we have a lot of information already. We have a lot of reference points. On electric trucks, customers still want to create that and telematic systems and understanding where the trucks are, understanding the operation and being a little bit closer to the day-to-day -day work that they do is going to be extremely important there. And that's the goals for the truck, but also for the charging station. Because if the charging station is down, of course, the truck doesn't charge. So mm. having uptime on the vehicle and on the charger, of course, are both important. And that, you know, knowing where to charge right? Uh, because if you can't use a public charger, then, you know, is it up to the company to establish or, or you know, charging stations in different locations, or it's that you have to be able to do your route and get back home, uh, you know, to the depot in order to charge? I mean, those are some considerations too, right? Or, or do truck companies start partnering on uh, setting up you know, truck charging stations that are, you know, that serve multiple companies. I mean, there's a lot of these things to consider. Oh, yeah. And there is there is a lot of companies that are creating new business models today and a lot mm -hmm. of uh, companies looking at it from multiple different angles. And that is also uh, where we come back to our initial question when you said, you know, the large trucks versus the small trucks, because uh, they potentially need different infrastructure to be able to operate. So mm -hmm. um, especially the larger trucks will usually only operate on what's called DC fast charging. Mm -hmm. And those charging equipments are extremely expensive. Uh, they have, of course, the benefit that they charge very, very fast. Uh, and on some of the larger vehicles, it's the only way to charge them because it would be um, unreasonable to charge them on what's called AC or alternate current charging. And uh, for commercial vehicles, there is minimal charging infrastructure publicly available today. So these DC fast chargers that we sometimes see on the back of a big grocery chain, or we can find them online, those are all intended for passenger cars. And we have the problem that we discussed earlier that you can't really park a truck in there. Mm -hmm. So if customers electrify these large vehicles, they need to look at their own charging infrastructure, which is expensive and takes a lot of time to put into the ground. You need a mm -hmm. utility company on board, they need to assess that you have enough power at your location and so on and so forth. The big advantage we have on the Ryzen truck and the smaller class four or five vehicle here is that not only can you use your DC fast charging equipment that you might put in place for larger vehicles anyways, but you can also either in the meantime or as a final solution, use AC alternating current charge equipment. And those are very similar chargers that all of us know from our passenger cars when we plug them in at our garage at home. Of course, there's commercial grade uh, quality for mm -hmm. these uh, for commercial vehicles, but essentially it's the same power that is needed there. And those chargers can get put into the ground a lot faster. You're talking about weeks of lead time and not years. And the cost of these are significantly, significantly smaller. So ask fleets are back against the wall because they either want to make a meaningful change here quickly with electric trucks or they up against timelines for um, regulation. That is what we consider the most efficient pathway to compliance is to start with a smaller vehicle like the Ryzen truck here, start with AC charge equipment that can be put into place very, very quickly, and then start learning that way as you mm -hmm. make decisions at scale for much larger vehicles. Is there ever a situation where the the trucks uh, would go home with the driver and be charged at home? And so then, you know, the company would then look at installing the appropriate charger at the, the employee's home 
Um, and then of course there's a whole other uh, element to <laughs> how does the employee get reimbursed for the energy mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But I mean, when there's a lack of public infrastructure right. to charge these, that could be an alternative, right? I just don't know that, you know, you really want to park a cement truck outside your house. However, it, if yeah. you have the room, <laughs> you might, you might right. consider it. I don't know. Right. Um, I'm just curious if, if that's a, if it does, an option. It does happen sometimes on the larger trucks, not so much, but on smaller vehicles uh, that sometimes double as a parts truck, or maybe they are a manager mm -hmm. type of vehicle or a sales type of vehicle. That does happen that customers take these uh, vehicles to their personal home and then uh, head out from there. But on the larger vehicles, it's uh, very unlikely. Uh, one thing to note, though, on the smaller vehicles, even though we said for the large trucks, it's very difficult to get them in parking spots for passenger cars. On the smaller vehicles, if you are in a pinch and you need to top off somewhere, that is, of course, a lot easier to get a, a vehicle like that into a passenger car parking spot. And then uh, for the cost reimbursement, and of course, the devil's is in the details sometimes, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. luckily, the charge equipment is usually smart enough to really identify how many kilowatt hours were dispensed and potentially even if the rate is uh, loaded there, how much that actually costs. So there is some ways around that as well. So one one question I'll, I'll throw out to you that we actually didn't really prep for, but uh, I feel remiss if in today's day and age, we're not mentioning AI in some way, shape or form. Um, are you seeing AI or automation find its way into the the charging or transition um, of the, the smaller class of trucks uh, to, to electric? Yeah, I mean, I think AI makes their way into Everything. all aspects of our <laughs> daily life, right? Yeah. Um, for trucks specifically, we certainly see a lot more automation happening, uh, usually for safety considerations, right? So uh, we have more cameras on board, we have more radars on board, and of course, through AI and machine learning, those sensors and the back end of those sensors get more and more or smarter and smarter, and therefore getting better and better at preventing accidents or at least mitigating them to a high degree. And uh, certainly when it comes to the optimal charging, when it comes to charging at uh, rates that are lower than the peak rates, that's also already something that happens today through what it's called smart charging, but um, AI and machine learning as we go into a more and more efficient way of transportation will certainly play a bigger and bigger factor as we move forward. We, we talked about electrification mainly today, but of course, autonomous driving ADA systems are mm -hmm. uh, similarly improved as we move forward to ultimately make these vehicles safer and safer and uh, more and more affordable to operate uh, ultimately. But uh, the upfront cost on most of these technology items is usually pretty high and the payoff right. comes through the operation. Thank you for raising the, the cost issue again, because one question I did want to ask and I forgot was, um, I imagine there has to be some type of subsidy or pro grant program through the states or the federal government, especially if they're um, issuing regulations and, and stating you have to make the transition and so how, how what, what kind of programs are you aware of and and where can companies find out more information about that yeah so there are certainly incentives that help companies overcoming the higher purchase price of not only the vehicle but also the charging equipment i will say every incentive is different there are some incentives mm -hmm. that are very prominent and have been around for a long time uh, the HVIP program in California is one of those examples. I will warn listeners, though, that only looking at the incentives is the wrong approach mm -hmm. because the, mm -hmm. old, the old saying goes, you can't mandate what you incentivize or you can't incentivize what you mandate. And that is also the case here to some degree. So there is a regulation uh, in California. It's called the Advanced Clean Fleet Rule that dictates that Customers, drivers, fleet operators need to have an increasing percentage of their fleet to be zero emission, which essentially means electric. Um, and there are also incentives to help them overcome their purchase price, but you can't double dip essentially. You can't take the money and then also count it towards the uh, compliance regulation deadlines. So I always advise customers, especially also when they look at their budget here, uh, mm -hmm. have real numbers 
the actual numbers before incentives get applied. Every incentive that you get makes your project cheaper and better and more efficient. But don't look at the incentives as the only driver here. The right. driver should be either the uh, emission reduction or the compliance. The financial aspect is a big aspect here, but um, the electric vehicle will not be cheaper than your combustion engine vehicle. Right. So there will still be a significant investment needed even yes. after the incentive. So yeah, I think it's a great point that you make about being realistic. Um, so we're coming to the end of our episode. And so there's clearly, I feel like there's a lot to be done. It almost feels like uh, with the the smaller trucks, we're at the stage where we were with passenger vehicles, maybe, uh, you know, a few years ago, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's growing, right? There's a, there's a lot of possibility, but also a lot of uh, problems to solve. And so What's the most exciting thing for you? And, and what do you think will happen in the next 12 to 24 months? So first of all, it is an exciting time, right? Mm -hmm. We are changing in industry. Uh, there is a lot to do. There's a lot of to do for a long time. We talked about all the challenges with uh, vehicles potentially being heavier, them being more expensive, it being diff more difficult to put in operation. But the great thing is once a customer, a driver is behind the wheel of these trucks. They love them. Uh, they are quiet. Really? There's no vibration. There's mm. instant acceleration, instant torque. You have regenerative braking and therefore putting bad, putting energy back in the batteries instead of wasting it on a on an engine brake. So um, drivers don't smell like like diesel or other other fluids when they come home. It's less fatiguing on the on the body with less vibration. So hmm. that is the ultimate end goal always. It's just how easy it is once you overcome the problems and how enjoyable it is to drive these vehicles once somebody's on the road. I can tell you, I got a lot of people into an electric truck that didn't want to buy them. I didn't get a lot of people out of an electric truck. That didn't <laughs> want to buy them. So once they are in the vehicle, there is nothing to complain about. It's a great vehicle. And uh, once we navigate all these other challenges that we have in the truck electrification, I think it's going to be a win for everybody involved. You know, the point about being less fatigued as a driver, I didn't even think about that, but it's absolutely true, right? Like how many people do you know that do drive a lot and you just get home and you're just ugh, so tired, like all I want to do is sit and um, you know, driving does take a lot out of you. And so if that can be minimized, I mean... That's amazing. So, and um, and especially for vehicles that drive in urban environments a lot, and in California, of course, we have a, a lot of big cities here mm -hmm. that have a lot of traffic. So the drivers that drive these vehicles, they also tell you um, they are in it and they are passionate about it for the sake of their children and the sake of their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So if they, you know, five, 10 years in the future, when electric trucks is a normal thing for us to be able as a driver to say, hey, I, I was, was one of, of the first people to sit behind an electric truck and drive this shift in the industry mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. it's a pretty big deal. And whenever we have these ride and drive events or uh, we have customers over and show them the vehicle, and of course they can drive the vehicle around. Sometimes they're a little bit timid and say, ah, no, I don't need to drive it. And I always tell them this, you join by, by sitting behind the wheel of this electric truck, you join a very exclusive small group of people that have the privilege of driving electric trucks. Don't throw that privilege away. It's a big, big deal. Well, and I can't think of a better note to end this episode <laughs> on. So thank you so much, Alexander. This has been just such a, a great conversation. And, um, I hope that our listeners found it uh, informative and exciting. I mean, like you said, it's a very exciting time to be, uh, to be in this industry. So thank you so much, Alexander. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Mile Marker Podcast. If you liked what you heard today, give us a like, share this episode on social media, and even take a minute to give us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you can join us for future episodes full of insights and ideas to keep the mobility industry moving forward.